DA Bonnie DeManis is under fire for charging a young man and others in what some say is a case of guilt by association. A crackdown on homeowners renting space to tourists in the booming Airbnb market. And abortion opponents mobilized to block an alliance between Planned Parenthood and a city-owned hospital in El Centro. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of some of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me on the roundtable today are Sarah Libby, Managing Editor of Voice of San Diego. Hi, Sarah. Hey. Good to see you back. Richard Montenegro-Brown, Local Content Editor of the Imperial Valley Press. Hi, Richard. Hi. Glad to have you here. Hi. And UT San Diego reporter Lori Weisberg. Lori, great to see you oh, back again. Good to see you. Well, give San Diego District Attorney Bonnie DeManis full marks for creativity. She's apparently the first prosecutor in California to use a section of the penal code to charge people in gang shootings who were not directly involved in the crimes. Sarah, let's start with that law. How did uh, 15 San Diego men get charged here in shootings? They really weren't at the scene. Yeah, so this all stems from a package of criminal justice reforms that was passed over 10 years ago, um, but this is still the first time anyone in California um, has tried it. Um, and so a few of the people charged in the case um, were directly involved in these shootings, at least according to the DA, um, but a big group of them, um, including the rapper Tiny Doo, who's gotten a lot of attention, and this young man that I wrote about, Aaron Harvey, um, the DA is not suggesting that they were involved in these shootings in any way. They're just saying that because they were a member of this gang that they benefited from the crimes. Now, Aaron says that he's not in the gang at all and whether he is is sort of immaterial because the underlying sort of theory is that it's guilt by association. All right, and we're gonna get into a lot of details about that and who he is in a moment here. Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of background. Uh, what does the DA office say about these crimes? I mean, lay out the crimes for us. There were no fatalities in these shootings. Uh, how many folks were shot? It was in 2013. Right? Yes, yeah, so it was a series of shootings, I believe maybe about eight shootings, and some of them I think in were just um, around Lincoln Park. Okay. Um, and so some of them were just shootings at structures, I believe, and others were um, resulted in attempted murder charges. Okay, and um, but there were no fatalities and, and some folks were injured in these, wounded in these. That's how I understand it, okay, yes. Okay, good. Now, they're charged with conspiracy under the law regarding uh, gang crimes. What would be the penalty they might face if they were convicted? Well, it's untested because this is the first time that we're seeing these charges brought. So the DA's office has told me that it could be anywhere from about seven years in prison up to life in prison. And so obviously that's a big difference, but they are facing ultimately life in prison if a judge decides that's an appropriate punishment. Okay, and you, and you touched on this. Where does this come from? 182, that's the uh, murder penal code. So this is a subsection of that. Uh, right, so a this, conspiracy section. Yeah. yeah, so this came from um, a voter initiative called Prop 21, and it was backed by uh, former Governor Pete Wilson. So the big sort of uh, thrust of those reforms at the time w had to do with charging juveniles as adults. Um, and the pendulum has really swung in the other direction since then, where we're kind of lessening charges and finding ways to keep people out of prison. And this was very much the opposite of that. Back in the law and order days, Lori? Well, as you, as you mentioned, this is a very creative use of this statute. Is, can you, have you been able to divine why Bonnie DeManis chose to do this? Is it to raise the profile of her office, look, oh wait, look make her look, I'm really tough on gangs? Where, where is this coming from? I think sort of all of the above. I think, of course, her detractors or people who are concerned by what she's doing would say that it's um, to sort of bolster, you know, possibly convictions or to sort of look like she's cracking down on gangs, but perhaps going too far. No, you mentioned Tiny Do, this, this rapper. Briefly, what was his connection to uh, the shootings or the, the gang, as it were, to draw him into this case? Right, so both Tiny Do and Aaron Harvey um, insist that they're not members of this gang and they simply fell into the California gang database by virtue of living in this rough neighborhood and being seen with other people who live in the neighborhood. Um, the DA's office, of course, contends that they're hardcore gang members. Um, so and where th are they getting that? I mean, just ties to other people who are documented as gang members. The criteria is vague enough that if you're 
in the right neighborhood and seen, you know, wearing certain clothing that's associated with the gang or flashing hand gestures and pictures that you could be um, labeled as a gang and, member. And Tiny Do, the rapper, had some, some lyrics that talked about the shootings. There's maybe a direct connection, according to the prosecutor. And then um, the, the fellow that you focused on in your story, Aaron Harvey, though, uh, it was social media, some things on Facebook? or Right. So there are a series of Facebook posts that are entered into evidence against him. Th those aren't the only pieces of evidence, um, but those are a lot of them. So the DA's office says that a lot of these uh, gang activities are taking place on Facebook now. That's where they're making threats and sort of uh, taking photos of themselves with weapons to intimidate people. And so those are some of the photos. He says that they're just photos of him with his friends. Now your story says as part of the uh, prosecution's case or the theory of this case, uh, he somehow benefits even though they're not saying at all he was there or directly shooting people or things but he benefits somehow right. by being associated with the gang what's their theory on that? well they really haven't explained their theory other than to say that if you're a member of this gang and someone in the gang commits a crime then the whole stature of the gang goes up and so they haven't spelled out how he specifically benefited in any way other than sort of his reputation got a boost from this crime Lori? So when you when you look at these Facebook posts and, and talking to people, and I think the parents even said, you know, he, okay, he's no angel, but but you know, it's it doesn't rise to this level. Have you did you get the sense of where where is this mounting pile of evidence that, that they would lead them to actually go after him? Well, I mean, I think that probably he does have a lot of connections with people in this neighborhood. Now, whether that means he's a gang member himself, I I don't know. Um, his family has lived in Lincoln Park since the 50s, so of course he has been seen in the neighborhood, all over these different dwellings that are labeled as, as gang hangouts. Um, one of them is his grandmother's house, though, so whether that's him visiting his grandmother, or whether that's him frequenting a gang uh, hangout is sort of up for debate, but they really just come from kind of a, a whole trove of Facebook posts and sightings um, from the police where he was detained and questioned, not for any crimes, but just questioned because of being in the neighborhood. Now you interviewed the deputy DA on this case. What did he say, What uh, how he's going to make the case against uh, Mr. Harvey? So he pointed again to a lot of these Facebook posts, and his contention is that it's really not a close call. It's not a matter of you know, we just pulled together some photos of, of him with his friends, that it's much more specific than that, that he's flashing he's Lincoln gang, Park he's proud to be gang, gang gestures, yeah. that they're flashing weapons and making uh, threats to rival gangs and things like that. Now, you also interviewed civil libertarians, some legal experts on the DA's novel approach. What do they have to say about this case? Um, well, one of the criminal justice uh, law professors who I spoke with seemed to think that this was a constitutional use of the law and that the law itself seemed to be constitutional. Um, now, lawyers at the ACLU disagree and think that um, the law itself should be tossed out. Um, but So it's kind of up for debate, but even the DEA's office themselves told me that they think that ultimately a higher court will have to weigh in here. As they go along. I'm just, Lori? I'm just wondering if, if, if there's more publicity about this and then the trial gets underway, if maybe it does achieve the purpose that, that Bonnie DeManis wants and, it, and that gang members post less on Facebook. They're, they're less, I mean, they're, they're being more protective of themselves knowing that they could be nabbed under less this. Less out there, less promotional. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That could be, but I think it also works both ways. Um, a judge has already tossed out some of the charges for um, part of the group of, of defendants, and so I think that uh, this sort of reasoning has already been challenged, and, and it will only be more so as more right. people pay attention. A couple seconds left in the segment. One last question. Uh, Harvey's pretty outspoken. He's not taking this kind of lying down. He's out there and, and fighting back already in, in the court of public opinion. Right, and so is the rest of his family, too. His dad's a longtime city worker, um, which I think they say cuts against this narrative that he's this hardcore gang member. His family's intact. He's got parents with good jobs. Um, but yeah, they've been very outspoken, and he told me that he plans to now become an activist and crusade against this section of the law that he doesn't think is reasonable. Even a lawyer, maybe. Huh? Right. All right, and I guess the trial is set now for uh, April, so we'll take a look and see what happens in that case. Fascinating. All right, we're going to move on. The concept is simple. You want to escape winter back east, so you look for a cheap place to say, stay in San Diego County that won't bust your budget. 
a few minutes of internet research, and voila, you've got a spot in a private residence in uh, OB or Carlsbad. It's part of the sharing economy, and it's called Airbnb, and it's hardly that simple, is it, Lori? Tell us, uh, <laughs> explain what us, uh, to us to start what Airbnb and, and some sites like Verbo, which is a cousin of this, uh, are. Right, there's, they're, they're, there's a lot of them that are really popular. It, it, it is pretty much, as you say, that you can search online on Airbnb or Home Away, a number of these sites, and you can either rent a room in someone's house, which is more the typical Airbnb model, or you can um, rent someone's vacation home, that's a second home, that the whole home is being put out for rent, and you pay a rate, and then Airbnb takes a percentage, but you're never really asked to pay, unless you're in some cities, you're never asked to pay a hotel tax or anything, and that's one of the issues that's cropping up with this, but it, it is very straightforward, and you and you stay in, and people report, you know, wonderful times, and that, that, and that the the host themselves enjoy kind of showing people around meeting and, and people meeting new people places. from all over the yeah. world. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, it's it's pretty cheap, I would imagine. You're just getting a bedroom or you know small space there. You don't care. You're going to the beach. You're going to the zoo. You're out and about. You're just staying there to have a quick bite in the morning and uh, and not really hanging out at the place. Right, it works right. out. I bet the hoteliers are not thrilled with this. Um, you know, they have at least in San Diego. I'm not hearing a big hue and cry from the hoteliers. You would you would think so, but right now occupancies are pretty high in hotels. The hotel industry has made a big comeback, so it's not it's not as big an issue, I don't think, right now. Right it may become it, what the big issue is. It's becoming with the municipalities that aren't right. some of which some of whom are not getting the capturing the hotel tax that right. they would like to get. Right. So they're looking at a revenue stream here, the potential vein to tap, as it were, and they're not getting it. Right. Right. And and some are going after them. Right. And now, what about the neighbors? There have been some folks come in. They they party. They don't realize this is a, a quiet neighborhood. People have to go to work tomorrow. They're not on vacation. And so you're right. hearing some complaints there, right? Right. right. And I, saw, I saw talking to different people. There seemed to be a real distinction between people like running out in University Heights, North Park, some of the urban neighborhoods, and then Pacific Beach, Mission Beach, um, Ocean Beach. Yeah, and and it's disturbing their sleep. Some some people are investing and buying just so they can rent it out short term, not 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 to just you know month by month renters, but to rent them out for the short term. Uh, Vacationers, and mm -hmm. so yes, it is getting out of hand. And the, state, the beach area people don't feel like the city has cracked down enough, and, and you're seeing it all coming to a head because there's going to be two councilmen are weighing in next month on this. Okay, now some cities though in the county have cracked down on this, right? I mean, there's some restrictions in certain places. Tell us yeah, briefly so, about those. So Coronado and the Coastal Commission for Coastal Areas does not look kindly upon this, but. Uh, Coronados had their their rule for a long time. You, it has to be more than 26 days if you're going to rent Solana Beach, seven days or more, um, and then a lot of in other a private residence uh, in a private residence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excuse me. And then and then a lot of others um, is is more like just 30 days or less. Uh, mm -hmm. San Francisco recently uh, legalized these short term rentals after years of being legal, okay, uh, so, illegal. Excuse me. So San Diego's now got, kind of gotten the act. You've got some notices going out. You owe back taxes. There could be fines. Uh, you guys have written about this too at Voice. Yes. Yeah. It's seems like it's very much a uh, complaint driven so you could be running um, an Airbnb a room you rent out or your entire apartment um, and have no troubles and maybe stay under the city's radar but if you live in one of these communities like Pacific Beach like Mission Beach and your renters happen to make a lot of noise then you're probably going to um, have that flag raised and and have the city crack down on you. Now with San Diego, there, there, uh, there's a conditional use permit where you can be on the up and up and get permission to do this, but you guys did a story where it takes forever to get that thing, right? Yeah, and it uh, varies by neighborhood as I understand it, and there are a couple different permits depending on what you're trying to do, um, but the city sort of said, look, all you have to do is get this permit, easy peasy, no problem, but um, we sort of went through the permit data and found out that it can take um, about a year in some cases so it's not necessarily as easy as the city is maybe making it out to be. And, and one thing I'll be interested to see, because this is, as I said, coming to a head, it's going to go through a council committee, and the uh, Pacific Beach Planning Group wants to have a citywide ban on these um, for anything under 30 days, but the Coastal Commission in coastal communities has said that that takes away your access to the to the coast, having an affordable place to stay, and um, it'll be interesting to see if, if the city were to do anything close to that, 
the Coastal Commission might have to weigh in and might say, no, no, San Diego, you can't be that strict. You can be somewhat strict, but you can't, can't ban them entirely. Now, this is something, and, and you've, you've touched on this in, in your reporting, that this is something where we're going from a, an owning society to the sharing society. It's really a, an Internet phenomenon. We wouldn't maybe have heard of this 20 years ago before people had easy access to the Internet, right? Yeah, and I think that's sort of why the city's rules um, don't address Airbnb very well is because they haven't caught up to the technology. And so um, they just don't have the the infrastructure in place to deal with these situations. And that's why you see certain council members trying to scramble to put different rules in place that actually address it. Yeah, yeah and Car Carlsbad is doing that too. They're in the process. They're a little ahead of San Diego. They're circulating a draft ordinance and, and their assistant planning director even acknowledged, you know, we, we're, we have been behind the times. We have to catch up with, as you point out, this new sharing economy. But I mean, it seems so appealing. Richard, is this something you would do if you were going to go back to Washington or Pittsburgh or some other place for some reason? Would you go find a couch or a bedroom with somebody's house? It seems, you know, cheaper than a hotel. It sounds like a good idea. I'm not sure I would do that. Mm -hmm. um, but how are they, how are they kind of bringing these two, these two rideshare ideas together when you, um, these two sharing economy ideas together? How are they lumping that together? Yeah, they're different service. You've got Verbo, which is a different uh, kind of setup. You've got, uh, as we said, several other sites here, notably uh, this Airbnb. Uh, how do they reconcile them? Well, I mean, they, they, um, VRBO, the parent company, Home Away, says, you know, we're, we're different. Um, the the get re re Vacation rentals by owner. Re vacation I rentals by owner, yeah. Well, they're actually used. Yeah, well. They're saying the hosts are the, the hosts are the, um, the merchant of record, whereas Airbnb is for theirs. And I think you're talking, I think, are you talking about the ride sharing? The yeah. How, I don't know that they're linked, mm -hmm. but they're like Uber and Lyft. They're, it's the same idea. They're part and parcel yeah. of this, yeah, the this sharing. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. And they're right. competing with the cab drivers. So, yeah, yeah it's And all. it's still sort of this whole underlying problem of the city has to scramble to make rules for it. And so I think they've recently started to address whether Lyft and Uber can go to the airport and things like that. And you see them starting to respond to these different services around the city. So the cities are catching up with whatever this sharing aspect is, is what we're talking about. All right, we've got a few seconds left. Will it, when the dust settles and there's permits to pay for and taxes in place and all of this stuff, will it still be profitable for a lot of these homeowners to rent to tourists? I mean, there's a lot of money in this you know, internationally, right? Uh, so what? They, they, I mean, I shouldn't say so what, but mm -hmm. I think I think they're going to take. Uh, um, it's still there's going to be cut taken out, but right. I think they'll still be profitable. Right. It's money they wouldn't normally get. Or the alternative, they may say, you know what? I'm just going to go get a month to month renter and, and be done with it. Okay. That that might be the alternative. Okay, but there's enough. If it's 15 percent, and I put a little chunk of change down for a permit, let's keep doing it. I'm still making money, and I'm enjoying, as you say, meeting people. It's. I, I don't think it's going to go away. Yeah, unless the neighbors are complaining too much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll look for that and see what the city does as they get to uh, the rules on that. Well, we're going to shift now. Abortion may be legal in California, but it's very hard to get in the Imperial Valley. This, this is, is set, set to change this spring, spring with an agreement between Planned Parenthood and the El Centro Regional Medical Center. It paves the way for abortions to be performed at a clinic set to open soon, but that agreement is under fire from religious conservatives. So, Richard, start by describing that scene that you covered at the uh, city council there. That was uh, was quite a meeting, not the uh, normal order of business. I have never seen anything like that in 22 years of work at the newspaper. Um, there were well around 2,000 people. I think estimates were something like 4,000. Um, it was really, I mean, it was just a, it was a huge, huge presence. It was really coordinated. The people and, were busted. Yes, very organized. yes, there were five to seven, I think, farmer labor buses that had brought in dozens and dozens of people. Okay. Um, and again, these were both, most they were abortion opponents, religious they were almost conservatives, in, almost entirely faith-based um, mm -hmm. opponents of it. There, there were there were a smattering of um, pro-choice um, protesters, demonstrators mm -hmm. there. Um, but uh, there were no match. The overwhelming the crowd, number yeah. was, was the anti-abortion yeah. folks. All right, so let's talk about this agreement here. Now, this is between the city-owned hospital there, yes. although the, we'll get to this in a moment, the city council doesn't direct the activities of that hospital, and Planned Parenthood. What is it, this agreement? What does it allow them to do? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a basic transfer agreement that has to be, that is um, part of uh, state law, health and safety codes. I mean, basically any any outpatient or doctor's office where um, any type of minor surgery or surgical procedures will be done has to have this transfer agreement with a local hospital for continuity of care, mm -hmm. patient safety. Mm -hmm. El Centro Regional has executed 20 of these. Um, this particular situation. Something goes wrong, you yeah. get over to the hospital. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And 
El Centro Regional is taking it from the standpoint, at least the administration is, that this is a conventional transfer agreement. And um, they put it as an informational item on one of their board, their board agendas. This is the hospital board. Yes, yeah. the hospital board on one of their board agendas. And that's when the faith-based community kind of caught wind. Um, people I've spoke to in the faith-based community have said they kind of were caught off guard by this, and they rallied rather quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, this Planned Parenthood clinic, which would, I, I mean, abortion, um, Planned Parenthood, it's a very small portion of what they do. They do all sorts of, of uh, services for, for women and families, but this aspect of it, the abortion provider, they'd be the only one out there if they open this clinic in the spring, right? There just yes. aren't abortion providers no. in Imperial County. So women seeking an abortion would have to come to San Diego, Riverside, other places uh, with Within the region, there's nothing there. Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing in El Centro at this time. Okay, and so the idea of the anti-abortion folks, of course, is we want to keep it that way. Want to keep it out? Um, yes. Um, you know, it's a lot of this has been. You know, I think a, a, the fair share is it's a moral issue. I mean, they were bringing it up as a moral issue, but they're also driving the legality of it. They're also driving the the fact that they believe it was a Brown Act violation and the way it was dealt with. The, the transfer Brown Act being the Open Meetings Act yes. in California, the yes. public's business is out in the open. Now, what does the city council have to say and the city attorney there? And they're they're saying. Look, it's not our call. The, we, we may own the hospital as a city, but we don't administer it. Right? Back in 1986, the city um, gave up its governance of the hospital. Um, it, it decided to that it wouldn't be involved in the day-to-day -day operations at all. Um, so it, it hasn't been a direct. Um, it hasn't been a direct governing body for many years. Um, they do have three city councils that sit on a couple of voting, a couple of advisory. So council members are on the board. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it has no direct impact right now on whether it can reverse this reverse course. Um, on this transfer agreement. And as your story said, even the board really doesn't have, this is just, this can be done internally by the administrators at the hospital, right? And it has been done with other agreements. Yes, I mean, the, I mean, the reality is under under the way the ordinance is set up and, and just kind of the, the common practice with transfer agreements is this never had to come before the, the board. Mm -hmm. um, I think the hospital board did ask that it be brought to them as an informational item. But one of the issues with the Brown Act, the potential Brown Act violation is it went immediately from information into closed session, mm -hmm. and then it was signed. So they're saying lack of notification, Absolutely. the public needs a certain amount of days, et cetera. Lori? So is the city, I thought I read that you, the city was going to seek some outside counsel or more advice to see maybe there's a way around this agreement? Or, or are, they, is there, are they taking some avenues or approaches to try to see maybe to, to get rid of this agreement? I'm not sure they would phrase it like that, but well, what they okay. have done, yeah, yeah. what they have done coming out of, coming out of closed session last week, is they've given directional direction to seek outside counsel just to see what their legal options are, and they've tasked two council members with making that choice. Um, this coming week, they're going to actually um, reconvene and talk about you know what their what some of that due diligence has uncovered. Um, I don't expect a decision to be immediately made, although it could be. Okay, now what does Planned Parenthood on their side uh, have to say about all this? They're not saying a lot, are they? No. Um, I had a chance to, spoke with, to speak with uh, Dara Johnson about a couple hours before that city council meeting. And whether it's... Tell us who, who that oh, is. She is the, um, she's the head of the Planned Parenthood of the, of the Pacific Southwest. Okay. Um, Planned Parenthood has not had a presence at any of these meetings, hospital board meetings, city council meetings. And um, whether it's something that's policy or not, um, Dara pretty much said that uh, it's that's not going to happen. Um, they don't see it as a social issue. They don't see it as a moral issue. They see it as a legal issue, and they will not engage in that type of debate. Okay. And what about the the board members, the hospital board folks, the people who administrators over there at the hospital? What do they have to say, if if anything? Well, two uh, two members of the hospital board did resign over this, um, and the sense I get is that some of it was moral. Um, but I think that they feel like um, it procedurally it wasn't, the, the hospital didn't handle it well. Okay. I think the overall issue is well, I maybe don't... Maybe they just don't want the heat? I mean, you, you don't want you could, don't like the heat? It could, out could of the kitchen, be, yeah. it could be, but, I, but really what I think is going on here is um, this is an extenuating circumstance. Yes, it's a transfer agreement. Yes, it's, you know, lock and stock that it has to be done. Mm -hmm. But the reality is with such a hot button issue, they... I think people feel like they could have given the faith-based community a little bit more um, vocal time 
in the form of the hospital board meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where some of the board, uh, the hospital board members are upset on how it, on how it came to be. Lori? Uh, were you getting a sense, well, I know Planned Parent hasn't spoken a mm -hmm. lot, but given the fact that this, there is really no opportunity for, uh, there's no abortion clinics elsewhere in that area, did Planned Parenthood give you the sense that there's a really growing demand and they're feeling, yeah, it's tough feel, to get it that way. I mean, I know, feeling it, yeah. a need because there is, I mean, it, that's a more remote area for for getting that kind of service. Well, Dara used the, Dara Johnson used the, um, the figure that the, the teen rape pregnancy rate in Imperial County is 70% higher than the state average. All right, so um, that would give you an indication. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not sure whether that is in fact accurate. Um, the last numbers we have from Imperial County are, t it's 2011 data. Mm -hmm. It is in the top five. It's greater than 55%. Okay, so significantly, yeah, teen pregnancy rate is significantly higher yes. out there than it yeah, is top five in the state. across the state. So you would think that would give you some sense of, of the need and the demand for this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we've got just a few seconds left. Uh, where do we stand now? It's supposed to open later this spring, but, but that may be in doubt. Well, the transfer agreement's been signed. It had to be signed. Um, Planned Parenthood is moving forward. They plan to open in April. Um, I think as a side note, though, um, the faith-based community felt like it was caught off guard here. Um, they have now since mobilized into a number of different subcommittees. All right, and then and we'll have to see if the other side comes forward, too. And, and that's All right, we'll look for more reporting on that. Thank you. That does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Sarah Libby of Voice of San Diego, Richard Montenegro-Brown of the Imperial Valley Press, and Lori Weisberg of UT San Diego. And a reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, KPBS. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.